you know, if you listen to a complex piece of music, or at least this is my experience with complex music, is sometimes the first time I hear it, I don't really like it, and I don't, I don't, I think I also don't understand it. I actually can't hear it. You know, maybe a musical genius could hear the whole thing instantly, you know. Say, uh, Franz Liszt, they say he could sight read anything on the piano, first try. So, you know, some people are so intelligent musically that it's incomprehensible, and I'm sure they hear things just fine the first time they hear them, but for, then what happens for me is that if I listen to it a couple more times, there are pieces, chunks of it that start to fall into place that I can follow, and, and you know, I can see the beauty sort of shine through those, and then eventually the whole thing links together, and then I can listen to it, especially if it's a complex piece of music, many, many, many times. And the more complex, and probably the better the piece of music, the more I can listen to it. But if I listen to it enough, at some point, then I've had enough of it. And it's all very strange phenomena. Because one of the things you might ask yourself is, what exactly are you learning while you're doing that? You're, you know, it seems like you want the music, it's something like you want the music to be just exactly the right amount of predictable and unpredictable. And if it's too unpredictable, then you can't understand it. And if it's too predictable, it's boring. And so it's just like a conversation that way. It's actually just like life as well, you know, because you want things to be predictable and stable, and you want things to be unpredictable and interesting. And the degree to which you want each of those is going to depend on the time and the context and also on your own intelligence and temperament. So... Now, I'm going to tell you a bunch of stories and give you a bunch of, a number of pieces of information, and hopefully they'll click together. Now, I think the reason that this information has always been transmitted in story and image form is because it's very, very difficult to transform it into articulated, like, into fully articulated explanation. It isn't really how it works. You know, we're not really accustomed to thinking about the idea that there are certain forms of information that and that, that are valid forms of information that can't be transmitted verbally. But, of course, if you think about it, we all understand this deeply because, well, I can give you a bunch of examples. The first example is that when you speak, not only do you speak in words and phrases and sentences and paragraphs, but you also speak melodically. And, in fact, part of the reason that you can understand melodies and that they make sense to you is that what artists have done is separated the melodic element of speech from the semantic element and then played with the melodic element. And the melodic element tends to carry a lot of emotion and intent. And so if you're listening to someone speak, you can tell when they're being ironic, you know, because they raise an eyebrow and their voice changes slightly, even though they might be using, in fact, they are using exactly the same words. And in fact, someone who's very good at being witty or ironic will set the situation up so that you can barely tell that they're joking. And the better they are at that, the tinier the hint they give you that you can still catch on to, the funnier the situation is. So, so we know that information can be transmitted through nonverbal channels. It, it even happens during speech. And then, of course, we understand that music presents to us an intimation of meaning that's very difficult to fully grasp. And music, for me, has always been an uh, ineffable phenomena in some sense because it carries the intimation of meaning in a manner that can't be rationally dismissed or that people aren't interested in rationally dismissing. So you, even punk rock nihilists listen to punk rock nihilistic music and they... You know, they find that meaningful even though they don't believe in meaning. And, and, you know, in some sense they're victims of their own rationality because they do believe in meaning or they wouldn't be listening to the music, but they can't understand how they could possibly believe in it, so their rational mind has dispensed with the idea. And, and sometimes that's people dispense with the idea of meaning for lots of reasons, partly because, of, because it's inevitable in some sense with sufficient rationality, but also because, because it's always useful to look for the underbelly of things, because it also justifies not bearing any responsibility for your life. And that, that's a fairly, um, what? That can be a very desirable side effect of a particular ideological or rational belief. And then there's dance, of course. And dance is even more ineffable than music, although it's often paired with music, you know. And, it's, and it, it grips people. If you see a remarkable dance performance, well, part of it is that you're sort of 
thrilled and excited about seeing just exactly what the human form can do, you know, because perhaps partly because you're human and when you see someone extending a certain ability far beyond the norm, then it expands your sense of what a human being is capable of, so there's, so there's that, there's just the pure skill element, and then there's the novelty element, because often if you watch a particularly good dancer, there's things they do that you haven't seen before that you didn't know anyone could do, and that's pretty fun. And then often the dance is, is joined with the music, and the body is expressing what the music means, and even though you can't tell what the music means, you can tell that the dance is expressing it. And See, I think what happens there is that music represents the patterns of being. It's actually because people think of music as a non-representational art, but I think that's wrong. I think it might be the most representational art, is that being is made up of layers of, patterned, layers of patterns constantly interact, interacting, and hopefully in a relatively harmonious way. And music, music demonstrates that, mimics it in some sense, abstractly, and then the dance is an abstract representation, like people adapt to the patterns of being, and the dancer adapts to the pattern of music, and so it's a, it's a symbolic, it's an embodied display of the place of the person in the cosmos, and you can, you can also make that case when you see people dancing in pairs, because you can dance alone, or you can dance in pairs, and that's basically standard human adaptation. So... And music is interesting, too, because one of the things that you'll notice is that there's always music in a movie, almost always. There's the odd movie that doesn't have it, but it's, it's quite marked when it's absent, you know. The movie feels a lot more cold and clinical, although it can work. But we accept the idea that music can be used to fill in the missing context in a movie without even ever questioning it, right? Like, it's very strange, if you think about it, that you go to a movie that is doing at least at least part of its function is to portray reality in a realistic way, but there's a soundtrack playing in the background all the time, and you don't, you know, it, it's so useful and so um, appropriate that you don't notice how strange it is that that's okay, 